Hi everyone and welcome to SAMA, a program which invites an expert to talk about their area of expertise. This week we are delighted to have Dr. Garth Nicholson, PhD, as our guest expert to talk about chronic infections and neurodegenerative diseases and the Gulf War Syndrome. Garth is the founder, president, chief scientific officer and Eremitus research professor of molecular pathology at the Institute of Molecular Medicine in Huntington Beach, California. He has won many awards, such as the Burroughs Welcome Medal of the Royal Society of Medicine in the United Kingdom, the Stephen Padgett Award of the Metastasis Research Society, US National Cancer Institute Outstanding Investigator Award, and the Innovative Medicine Award of Canada. Now, during this interview, Dr. Garth Nickerson will be sharing chronic infections and neurodegenerative diseases, the Gulf War Syndrome, bioterrorism, and the benefits of hydrogen-infused water. So welcome to our show, Garth. It's fantastic to have you back. Well, it's, uh, I'm glad to be back on your program. For people watching, Garth can also be viewed on episode 47 of SAMA. Now, um, the first question that I'd love to ask you is, um, what is the role of chronic infections in neurodegenerative diseases? Is it the thing that starts the neurodegenerative diseases, or is it just a participant that makes it worse? Well, we just don't know that question. Uh, that's a very important question, and it's uh, just not known. But let me give you a little background on it, because we have actually got into neurodegenerative diseases from our work with Gulf War veterans. Now, an unusual number of Gulf War veterans are coming down with neurodegenerative diseases at a very young age, generally under 25, and this is uh, incredibly unusual. Most neurodegenerative diseases are diseases of the middle age, so we don't generally start seeing them until patients are over 30 years of age. That's right. But now all of a sudden we were seeing them in very, these very young, very healthy uh, people, and we wanted to figure out exactly why. And it turns out we'd been studying uh, Gulf War veterans because of their illnesses, and particularly they have a group of illnesses that are kind of collectively called Gulf War syndrome or Gulf War illnesses because they seem to involve a number of, of different uh, events that occurred before they became ill. Yes. One of these events is infection. And we find this in about 40% or so of the Gulf War veterans that we've looked at who are ill, they have an unusual infection. And without going into it, we wrote a whole book on how we found this, and it's called Project Daylily. And these infections, uh, we think, may have come from the vaccines that they were given during deployment. Gosh. And the reason we feel that way is because there were some uh, military personnel who were uh, vaccinated uh, but not deployed because the war ended so quickly in 1991. And a few of these came down with a very, the, exactly the same type of disease as the veterans who were deployed. Gosh. Not at the same incidence rate. Right. Because the incidence rate for illness among the deployed forces is about 30 to 35 percent of the deployed forces are, are ill it's awful. Uh, and have been ill since the Gulf War. And this goes across uh, countries, for example, Canadians, Americans, British, Australians. They all have that same approximate percentage of illness from the, from the Gulf War they serve, except for one country, France. And the difference was that the French used a different strategy instead of using immunizations, which were primarily to prevent uh, susceptibility to biological warfare agents that we knew the Iraqis had yes. in their arsenal. Yes. Uh, instead, the French used prophylactic antibiotics. They didn't come down with any cases that we know of, of Gulf War illnesses. Uh, so that's uh, the one thing that we do know. And also, there's another interesting finding. There were French forces embedded uh, into U.S. Uh, units, for example. Uh, some officers, French officers, for example, were embedded into U.S. units. And they did not have the same uh, vaccines that the Americans received. And they did not come down with the same illnesses that the Americans that they served right next to came down with. So we think that to, to some degree, 
uh, some of these illnesses were, were due to chronic infections. And we think that many of these infections came in the vaccines that they were given. Gosh. So one of the infections that we found was called mycoplasma. And this is a very unusual primitive bacteria that resides and hides inside cells. And because it gets inside cells, you can't mount an effective immune response against it. So it escapes the, most of our immune systems, which are really set up to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. So these little uh, primitive bacteria, primitive because they've lost a lot of their genetic material because they live inside host cells, mm -hmm. they depend upon the host to provide them with a wide variety of materials so they don't have to make them themselves, so they don't need the genetic material to actually make those substances and those metabolites. They just steal them from the host. And because of that, uh, over time, they've lost a lot of their genetic uh, materials. So they're very primitive, they're very small, and they have a reduced amount of DNA inside them. So these are the primitive bacteria. They don't have a rigid cell wall that bacteria that live outside have to have to survive. Because they don't have this rigid cell wall, they have to live inside our cells. So they're intracellular. And that turns out to be very important. And the reason it's very important is that to link it up with the neurodegenerative diseases that we found at a very, and others found at a very high rate among these young veterans, mm. these types of infections, when they're released from cells, they tend to uh, pick up an host antigens from the membrane of the host cell that they're inside. And this can cause a number of different problems, and one of those is an autoimmune response. So that's part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that we consider mycoplasma to be a neurogenic infection. That is, it likes to get inside nerves. Because of that, we find it in the central nervous system. These are very small. They don't have a rigid cell wall, so most bacteria cannot get into the central nervous system. But these small little intracellular, normally intracellular bacteria, if they're released from cells, can get inside because they can penetrate through the blood-brain barrier. The way they do that is they hitch a ride with the normal white blood cells that go in and out and pass the blood-brain barrier routinely. They can hitch a ride because they can penetrate into those white cells and then hide inside them so that when they penetrate the blood-brain barrier, they can piggyback them that way. And eventually, if they get released, then they can invade nerve cells and astrocytes and glial cells and other cells in the central nervous system. And eventually we think that this is a very important event in neurodegenerative diseases. Now we don't know that this actually causes it, but we think it's an important event. Now let me explain why. We don't know what actually causes neurodegenerative disease. There are a number of different theories about this, but none of them seem to be adequate to explain it. One of the things that we found was that in the case of Gulf War veterans, it came down with neurodegenerative diseases like Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, which is not a very high frequency disease, but it's been in increasing in frequency quite dramatically over the years. And you can't explain it mm. by normal genetics or some genetic susceptibility, for example, down through your gen something else going on. So we're talking about sporadic cases. It can't be linked to uh, a genetic tree of some sort. Right. So in these sporadic cases, uh, we find that uh, a very high percentage of these patients turn out to have these little microorganisms called mycoplasma inside their cells. So when we looked at the Gulf War veterans, and we looked at, by the way, we looked at Americans, Canadians, even a couple of Australians, a couple of British, well, actually more than a couple of British. But, so they were veterans that we looked at from around the world who served in the Gulf War, who came back and came down with a neurodegenerative disease. And these are fairly young people. Right. 100% of them had this mycoplasma infection, this very unusual infection called mycoplasma fermentans. And this is the infection that we found in the Gulf War veterans that have a variety of different diseases that we call Gulf War illnesses. Mm. 
Gosh, but this subset of those diseases was very unusual. So first, it's very unusual that the veterans are coming down at age less than 25 with these unusual neurodegenic diseases like ALS, for example, and Parkinson's and others. So that's the first thing that's unusual. The second thing that was unusual was that 100% of them that we've tested had this infection. We couldn't find a a single one that didn't have this infection. So that's uh, an important lead. So with that information, we went back and said, look, as an important control on this, we've got to look at civilians who have ALS to see if they might also have this. So we looked at civilians, two sources. We, we had a, a source, uh, John Pomfret in, in England, uh, has a, had a unit that was studying ALS patients uh, in Great Britain. So that was one source that we used. And another source uh, that we had was uh, here in the United States. And so we took a look at the groups of patients from these two sources, and we found that about 85 to 90 percent of the civilians also had mycoplasma infections. So we think that that's an important link. The difference was that the mycoplasma species found in the Gulf War veterans was only one type that we found, mycoplasma fermentans. So that was a very unique species. Not much is known about it. Very high incidence in Gulf War veterans. And there's another population that, uh, if I have time, I'll discuss, which are prisoners that were involved in experiments in Texas that had a very high frequency of this. But otherwise, we don't see this as a high frequency in civilian populations, right. just these two groups. So the civilians with ALS uh, had a low percentage of mycoplasma fermentans, but they had other mycoplasma species. And the most common plasma species is mycoplasma pneumoniae. This is found uh, in atypical childhood pneumonia cases, for example, and uh, other cases of, of people that have chronic uh, diseases. So that was actually the one that we found the, the highest incidence in, in the non-Gulf War veterans. But we didn't find it. Uh, I think we found one Gulf War veteran that had it, but it was a co-infection with mycoplasma fermentans. Okay. So uh, this was a very curious finding and suggested to us that this may have some link uh, in the etiology or the pathogenesis of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So. Um, unfortunately, we, we applied for a number of grants to continue this work, but uh, nobody ever thought it was important or real. They, they just said, well, they just dismissed it. it. This couldn't be an infection that's involved in neurodegenerative disease, so they just dismissed it. I never got the funding to continue the studies, so we had to sort of leave it at that. On the other hand, we looked at a number of other uh, diseases, the most common one being uh, fibromyalgia, which is a fatiguing illness with widespread pain uh, that uh, mostly women get this, at least two or three to one women over men come down with this condition of fibromyalgia. Nobody knows how this starts, but we found see, of infection with mycoplasma uh, of various sorts, mostly the civilian variety, mycoplasma. And the other disease, which is uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, as it's called in, in the UK. And uh, this, we also found a high frequency, not as high as fibromyalgia, but over 50% of the patients had these same types of infections. So we have a group of fatiguing illnesses with a high frequency. We have a group of uh, military veterans, uh, specific incidents that served in the Gulf War and became, came home, became sick. They have it at very high frequency. So there's that link between the disease pathogenesis and the presence of, of these very unusual mycoplasma infections. Now, there's some other illnesses, and particularly rheumatoid arthritis, uh, disease of the joints, for example, and other areas. It's a, it's a neuromuscular disease. Uh, most people know what arthritis is. You get inflammation of the joints and so on. There, it's well known that mycoplasma plays a, a role and it's been known for years that you can find mycoplasma in the synovium or the fluid in the joints, for example. And so there's a direct relationship that some people think at least between the presence of mycoplasma in joints 
and rheumatoid. So that's one disease where I think it's pretty well established. But there are a number of other uh, illnesses that are just casual, ca casually linked to the presence of uh, mycoplasma. And this is, can be found on our website if people are interested. And I should give you our website. It's immed.org. It's like immediate.org. And people can go on the website and find out more about the variety of different illnesses that are associated with these unusual infections and you know how to get tested and so on. And how to, the important thing is how to get treated if you have them because most physicians, most practitioners have no idea about how these types of infections should be treated. And so that's important uh, because there are a lot of people suffering because their practitioners just don't have the knowledge to deal with this because these are kind of unusual. And uh, because of that, they've never been taught in medical school how to address these types of infections and how to treat them properly. Right. So that's another story, which I'm, I'm not going to go into, uh, but that's kind of the background on it and how we, uh, I'm not going to go into the details on how we found it. It was a very long process of, yes. to figure out exactly what type of microorganisms might be involved. But the, the key piece of information that we had after the Gulf War that suggested very strongly that infections were involved in the disease process of at least a half, 50%, 40 to 50% of the veterans was the fact that their family members were coming down sick when they had some of the very similar signs and symptoms that were present in the veterans. But they were perfectly fine until the veteran came back and became sick. And then they slowly started to become sick. And usually it was the spouses that would be becoming sick first. And then their children one by one were becoming ill. And the most uh, frequent problem with the children is because they were becoming autistic. And so this goes back to link with vaccines yes. and the whole business of autism and vaccines. So uh, without getting involved in that, which is a whole other story, which is uh, still in the process, it's highly contentious, as you can imagine, and so on. But in this group of Gulf War veterans, family members, it was very obvious. These kids weren't autistic before the veteran came back. The veterans that came back who didn't have the infection, the children were fine. The veterans who had this infection and becoming sick with Gulf War illnesses or a neurodegenerative disease, their family members were getting sick slowly and their children were becoming autistic. And so when we looked at those autistic children, almost all of them, more than 90% of them, had the same infection as their adult veteran family member. So they weren't sick before the veteran came back. They became slowly sick afterwards and they had the same infection that we found in the veteran. So that's pretty compelling evidence that in fact the infection may have, may have caused this problem. Yes. And in fact, uh, vaccine contamination with mycoplasma is a problem that vaccine manufacturers never want to talk about, never want to talk about them because from, for the most part, they don't test for these types of contaminants in vaccines. It's very hard to test for them. And so in general, they, they just don't do it. So here's a big whole area that, that uh, I'd rather not get involved in because that's a whole lecture itself that... Yes. Um, we don't really have the final answer to no. our questions and anything else. And I think they're leads that we need to follow. And but so, now let's get so. back to the, the, uh, the Gulf War veterans who had the neurodegenerative diseases. And then, as I mentioned, this led us to civilians that had neurodegenerative diseases. And we started looking at those patients and we started finding a very high incidence of types of general class of infection, but not the same species of infection. So the Gulf War veterans had this unusual species, mycoplasma fermentans, that were related back, we think, to the military vaccines that they received during deployment. Could have been some other sources, but that's the most likely. Yes. The civilians, for the most part, didn't have that type of infection. They had a similar type, but a different species of mycoplasma. So in those patients, we found mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is very common mycoplasma at a very high frequency, but they also had some other mycoplasmas as well. Uh, those species are, are known in the civilian population as well. Uh, so we, we kind of had to leave it at that point. So we think that these infections play a role. Now, do they cause the, the, the disease? We don't know that. 
are they involved in the pathogenesis of the disease or the development process of the disease? That's where we think they're involved, or at least that's where we feel that they're involved. And why do we feel that? Well, one of the things that we look at uh, are the time uh, that people come down with the symptoms of the disease and their expiration. How long does it take? Because these are generally fatal diseases, not always, but in the case of ALS, it's generally a fatal disease. Gosh. How long does it take them uh, to die after they've been diagnosed with the illness? In the case of Gulf War veterans, they had a fairly normal course of the disease. They uh, underwent, uh, uh, they went downhill in terms of their pathogenesis, and, and generally they did, died within a year or more yeah. or two at the most. And in civilian population, they can live a little longer, uh, but in general, they also expire after, uh, within a year or two after being diagnosed uh, with ALS. So uh, we know that uh, that's a process that occurs fairly quickly. Now, the question is, the patients that don't have these infections. And there's an interesting point right there because those patients actually live longer than the patients that have the infection. So we know that the infection results in a more rapid downward course of the disease where the signs and symptoms uh, come on and uh, do not uh, remit. Those are called progressive disease states. They're non-remitting, so they don't uh, slow down. They have a rapid progression rate, and those patients die fairly quickly. So those are the ones that actually have these infections. And the ones that don't have them, that we can't detect them, they may have some other infection, but they don't have the mycoplasma. They generally survive for much, much longer periods of time. So we feel strongly that it's involved in the progression of the disease process. So it may not be involved in the inception, but it's involved in the progression. However, there's this lingering question. Um, what happened in the case of the Gulf War veterans who came down at a very early age? And this is a question that we can't answer. In those Gulf War veterans that came down with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, if they hadn't uh, picked up this infection or hadn't been given it through the vaccine, would they have ever come down with it? And we don't know the answer to that. Uh, so that's a lingering question that is this uh, something that's involved in the disease process, whether it's involved in the exception of the disease or the progression, we don't know. So those are questions that are open at the moment. And that's where we had to leave it because we couldn't get any funding to continue our studies. So I wonder why you couldn't get any more funding there, Garth. <laughs> well, this You're again, this is a... This is a very uh, contentious issue. There was a lot of pushback uh, against the, the role of mycoplasma in disease. And I always wondered why. Why is there all this political pushback against uh, mycoplasma? And uh, one of the things that we discussed in our book is the possibility that these may have, may have been developed, these microorganisms may have been developed as biological warfare weapons. And uh, that may have been why the political pushback. Uh, we just don't know. But uh, we just have to leave it at that at the moment. But in the whole process of dealing with these infections, we, we learned a bit about their treatment. And we learned a bit about the damage that they do cause in cells and why they're so devastating. And one of the, the and this gets back to the, my final topic I'll come into after a while, but uh, uh, this gets around uh, the types of problems that these infections cause when they're inside cells. So one of the major things that these infections do is that they cause an increase in the generation of free radical oxidants inside cells. So what are free radical oxidants? Well, these are things like reactive oxygen species. So these can be things like hydrogen peroxide and a variety of relatives of free radical oxidants uh, that are related to hydrogen peroxide in that they have oxygen, uh, but in fact they're free radicals and they can cause damage because they're reactivity. So these free radical oxidants attach themselves to various normal molecules inside our cells and because of that they can damage those molecules. For example, they can react with our DNA and damage the DNA and actually end up causing 
mutations of the DNA because they actually damage the DNA. They can react with proteins and cause formation of proteins inside our cells. But we were very interested in the lipids of the cell because it turns out the lipids, a particular type of lipid in the cell, are extremely sensitive to these reactive oxygen species and free radical oxidants. And those are the lipids that form the membranes of the cells. Now, the, the membranes are, of course, very important cells that form the barrier of the cell, the membrane that forms the outside barrier of the cell. But there are also a lot of intracellular membranes inside the cell that compartmentalize various parts of the cell. For example, the nucleus is compartmentalized by a double membrane, and the lipids uh, form the matrix of that membrane. There are also proteins in the membrane. But the lipids that make up uh, the membrane are called glycerol phospholipids. So it's a very particular class of lipids. So it's not what most people think of as lipids. They most people think of fat. And this is not fat. These are phospholipids. So these are particular types of lipids that form bilayer structures. And these bilayer structures are the foundation of membranes. And I happen to know a bit about membranes because the uh, model that's acceptable for uh, in your textbooks, for example, the uh, Singer-Nicholson model of uh, membranes or the fluid mosaic membrane. So I know a bit about membranes. So these phospholipids that are membranes are exquisitely sensitive to these uh, reactive oxygen species that cause damage to the membranes. And when those membranes are damaged, they become more rigid. And because of that, uh, they actually become more uh, susceptible to uh, penetration by various ions and so on. So across all our membranes, uh, we have what's known as an electrical chemical potential that has to be maintained for those membranes to be functional. And some of the organelles inside our cells absolutely dependent upon maintenance of this transmembrane chemical potential across, the, in the case of mitochondria, the inner membrane. So the mitochondria are like the little batteries inside our cells that provide the energy for our cells to, to operate and to do everyday functions that our cells are, are doing. So that energy has to be derived from somewhere. It comes from the mitochondria, or at least 90% or more of the energy come from the mitochondria. And they come from the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And if that inner membrane can't maintain this chemical potential across the membrane, chemical electrical potential, they can't generate ATP, which is the universal molecule that's required by our enzymes and everything else inside our cell to work. So when the mitochondria are damaged uh, because of these reactive oxygen species, we can't produce the energy that we need. And if we can't produce the energy we need, then the functions uh, tend to degrade. And so for somebody, for example, that has a fatiguing illness, they know that they don't have the cellular energy because they don't have the widespread energy that they perceive that they need. And so they're fatigued. And so we have all these fatiguing illnesses where people fatigue very readily and so on and so forth. So that's related to the energy that they produce inside their cells because that's necessary for everything that we do. And in the case of fatiguing illnesses, uh, our muscles, for example, require that energy to operate. So if we don't have them, then our muscular fatigue is, um, becomes a real, a real problem, a major problem. So the membranes inside our, our cells are very sensitive to the damage by these reactive oxygen species or free radicals. And what, what's the link between infections and free radical generation? Well, the infections like mycoplasma, which get inside our cells, stimulate the generation of these reactive oxygen species. So the generation goes way up if uh, these infections are inside cells. That means that there's a lot of these reactive oxygen species that are produced. They in turn damage our membranes, which in turn means that they're less capable of, in the mitochondria, of producing the high energy molecules that we need to perform everyday functions. So that's kind of the link between infections and fatigue. So people that have these infections like mycoplasma, fatigue is their number one complaint. So they have widespread fatigue and problems that are associated uh, with fatigue. And uh, that's almost, uh, or it is universal essentially, with people that have uh, these mycoplasma infections. And unless those infections are treated properly, uh, they're gonna continue to have the fatigue. And even 
if they're treated, the fatigue often lasts for a prolonged period of time because the generation of these uh, mycoplasma species goes on for a long period of time, even after the mycoplasma are successfully treated. There's a kind of a residual effect that continues. So then we get into the problem of, uh, okay, if the presence of the mycoplasma are associated with various uh, clinical uh, diseases, uh, if we treat those mycoplasmas, can we actually reverse the disease process? Now, neurodegenerative diseases can't be reversed. I mean, we know that. I don't know people that have ever thought that neurodegenerative diseases can be reversed by, by treatment. About the best we can do is slow the, the process down, slow the progression down. Maybe we can even halt the progression. That's about the best that we've been able to do with neurodegenerative diseases. Now, there's an exception to this, and that's people that uh, generally are younger that have had the, the mycoplasma, and because of the mycoplasma, all of a sudden they've gotten the uh, infection process in their central nervous system, and they're just starting to come down with the signs and symptoms of a neurodegenerative disease. That's the one area that we've been able to really reverse the whole process by successfully treating the mycoplasma infection. So we have a number of examples of children for veterans that were starting to come down with diseases that look like neurodegenerative diseases. So these are like teenagers, for example, and this is almost unheard of, of a teenager coming down with a neurodegenerative disease, but it, it can happen. And these Gulf War veterans family members, the teenagers that were then starting to show uh, these uh, neurological declines that were symptomatic of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, ALS, and so on, without going into the whole businesses of why these are separate diseases. I'll just say that these neurologic diseases were starting to show up in their earliest manifestations in these very young people who were this unusual set of patients from these Gulf War families. There, when we successfully treated the mycoplasma infection, we were able to reverse the process and those young people went on to lead normal lives. And now they, we know that they're now middle-aged people, actually. They're, they're adults. They're ter perfectly normal. In the case of the females, and many of them were females, um, they then went on to have normal births and normal children. So we've been able to see a, a very healthy outcome that there was no lingering effect uh, through the generations uh, for those particular patients. So that was the good news. We don't have a large number of these, but we do have a few and it's a great success. But neurologists uh, don't believe us because they just don't believe this could happen. But they're the living proof and I'll stand by it because after all, the neurologists were the ones that diagnosed them in the first place. I'm not a neurologist. I can't diagnose or I wouldn't even start to think I could diagnose a neurodegenerative disease. So we were totally dependent upon the neurologists themselves to diagnose these diseases. But once they diagnosed them and we were able to test them and find these infections and treat them successfully, uh, we then were able to reverse that process. So the general response was among the neurologists was, well, they didn't believe their own diagnosis after that. They said, well, we must have been wrong in diagnosing these young people with a neurodegenerative disease, we couldn't have been right because they recovered. And furthermore, we couldn't have been right because they recovered when a specific infection was treated and we know that those infections aren't involved. So that was the response that I found from, from neurologists. So I've pretty much been shunned by, by neurologists for the findings that we had and, and the treatments that we came up with for these early onset uh, neurodegenerative disease patients. Gosh. So uh, we had to sort of uh, end it at that because I couldn't get the neurologic community behind it. Uh, they were just were not convinced. And so they just have continued to go on and follow these patients until they die without really giving them an adequate treatment. So it's a very sad story from the neurological end and from the neurodegenerative disease end. But we were able to help a number of these very young patients. And we were able to slow down or even arrest the disease progression in a number of these patients that were diagnosed with neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, I think that's uh, 
about the end of the story. We have to leave it at that because we weren't able to continue it because mm -hmm. we could never get any funding to do this because neurologists would never believe that the infections were involved. And they were never, they never believed that we were able to successfully treat patients and see a reduction in their symptoms or at least a, a halt in the progression of the disease process, the normal disease process of their neurodegenerative disease. So we had to just sort of leave it at that, but we do have these data. I think they're real, I stand by them. The people that recovered, of course, are the living proof of, of what we did and, and their recovery. But uh, that's just uh, medical science is a very conservative area and uh, it just takes generations to convince people of, uh, of some of these, what I think are actually breakthrough uh, observations and processes. So again, let's now go back to the infections and what they cause inside cells because it's more than just the neurodegenerative diseases. We have a whole set of different types of autoimmune diseases. Uh, we have a whole set of different types of fatiguing illnesses where I think these mycoplasma infections are very important. And the fatiguing illnesses alone, we find that half of the patients that we look at have these infections. So we think they, at least in that half of the patients, they must be important. The other half of the patients may have other types of infections that are very similar, but we're just, we haven't identified them. Or they may have other things, other reasons why they're coming down with a fatiguing illness. But at least in the 50% or so that have the fatiguing illnesses, we, we have something that we can deal with. We have an infection that we can treat. And what do we know about those patients that we've treated uh, that have these infections? Well, the good news is that there's at least a fraction of those patients that have fully recovered from disease, and that's the good news. The bad news is that there are a lot of patients that we've tried to treat the infections, but they, they had other problems as well, and we, they weren't able to fully recover but they were able to improve their health because the infections were treated. So I think it was a positive in the case of those particular patients. So um, I think we, we have to kind of leave it at that, but the information is on our website. Again, it's immediate.org, I-M-M-E-D dot O-R-G. People can find out more about fatiguing illnesses. They can find out about autoimmune illnesses, which a large number of these uh, have to do with chronic infections, neurodegenerative diseases, and also neurobehavioral diseases. So I mentioned the autistic children of the Gulf War veterans. So what about autism, for example, and autistic spectrum disorders? So these are a number of different diseases that cover autism, Asperger's syndrome, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of these disease processes in young children that are neurobehavioral. In other words, the behavior is modified in these young patients. So generally, they're thought of as learning disorders, communication disorders, interaction disorders uh, in these young, uh, young people that come down with uh, these uh, autism spectrum disorders. Well, we did a separate study, separate from the Gulf War veterans, families, uh, in civilians. And we did this in Texas and California. So they're two different uh, areas, so they're geographically separate. In Northern California, we had different uh, groups of patients. So generally, these are started with studying with uh, autism support groups, and some of the families were interested in getting their uh, children with autism tested because in some of these families, more than one child was coming down with these autism spectrum disorders. And that's kind of a tip off right there, that it's not just a separate isolated child, there's more than one. Generally, these are larger families, multiple offspring. So in those families, we started testing these young people and we found that about one half to 60% of those children had mycoplasma infections. So here we go back all the way back to the same thing that we saw in the young children of Gulf War veterans that had these and were becoming autistic. Only these were actually young children that were diagnosed, fully diagnosed with autism. These weren't children that were showing autistic symptoms. These were children with full-blown uh, autism spectrum disorders. And these were diagnosed by you know, childhood uh, clinical pathologists. And so, so we knew that uh, these were the real thing. 
uh, not just showing some of the tendencies and showing some of the symptoms, but these were patients that had a full diagnosis. And in those cases, we found that, again, 50 to 60% of them were showing uh, systemic, so widespread infection with uh, mycoplasma. And as we expected, they had the type of mycoplasma that we find in childhood atypical pneumonia, that is mycoplasma pneumoniae. The majority of those patients had mycoplasma pneumonia, and that's exactly what we expected. Whereas in the Gulf War veterans children, they had primarily mycoplasma fermentans, which was the Gulf War associated infection. Right. So the link was to the mycoplasma, independent of how they got it and independent of the origin. So we could have a civilian population on one hand, and we could have uh, Gulf War veterans families on the others. They were coming down with what looked like the very same disease process, and the link was mycoplasma. Yes. Now, it turns out the civilian populations are a lot more complicated in that there seem to be multiple infections involved. So we found viral infections like human herpes virus 6, for example. We found other similar types of, of uh, mycoplasma, similar infections like chlamydia pneumonia, for example, in uh, those uh, civilian populations that we didn't find it in the, the veterans' family members. So the civilian populations that uh, were showing autistic children or autism spectrum disorders in their children, they presented with lots of different infections, or at least a few that we know of, at least some of which are similar to mycoplasma, and some of which are not similar, some of which are viral in nature. So uh, in those populations of civilian, uh, we also found infections at a very high rate in the children that were coming becoming autistic. So I think it's a very important point mm -hmm. of uh, autism spectrum disorders that chronic infections are present and should be looked at and should be considered in their treatment uh, yes. regimens as well. And that's something that's not being considered right now, and I think that's important. Now, a question I have, which... Um, was actually originally from Christine Bradburn, one of our online viewers, is talking about the vector, the means of transmission of the mycoplasm plasmas uh, from the veterans to their family. That must have been through just casual contact, serving dinner and touching things, right? Yes. So the mycoplasma, that particular type of mycoplasma, is an airborne infection. It's a fluid-borne infection. For example, it could be transmitted through sexual transmission, uh, can be transmitted through body fluid exchange, uh, for example, saliva exchange. Could be just a it, could be, uh, it could be transmitted as an airborne infection. Yes. As an airborne infection, it is not considered to be highly infectious. So it's kind of a poor infection as an airborne infection. It's much more capable as a fluid-borne infection. So, for example, we know that blood transfusions are very likely to transmit it. We feel that sexual transmission is a, is a real problem and a likely reason the spouses came down first in the families where uh, Gulf War veterans came back and their family members became sick. The children were uh, tertiary infections. The secondary infections were almost always the spouse. The children came down later. Yes. And that probably because those infections were probably primarily uh, airborne. And we know that as an airborne infection, mycoplasma is not very efficient. It's not very effective, but certain species are better than others. For example, mycoplasma pneumoniae is a fairly effective atypical pneumonia, uh, cause of atypical pneumonia. So we know that that one can be tr transmitted as an airborne infection. There's less information about mycoplasma fermentans. My feeling is it's not as efficient as mycoplasma pneumonia, but that's just a feeling okay. I have okay. just based upon our knowledge of the veterans and their family members. So what, from what you've said to now, a child can go to school and get um, Asperger's or other... Um, you know, learning disabilities 
That's by going well, to school. And that's what it suggests. That's not been proven by any means. So I don't want to scare people. I do want to tell you, though, that uh, it's pretty well known that these atypical pneumonias that occur in children, which are caused by mycoplasma at a very high frequency among children, it's one of the most common causes of atypical pneumonia. That is one possible way that children can get these types of infections. Now, we don't know, because I don't think it's ever been studied, if there's a link between atypical childhood pneumonia and uh, later uh, cases of autism spectrum disorders. I think that's something that really hasn't been looked at. And that's something that should be looked at, but it hasn't been looked at. On the other hand, we know that uh, adults that have a chronic fatigue syndrome, at least half of them that we've tested, have a variety of different species of mycoplasma as possible infections inside them. And they could transmit that to their children. Even in utero, a mycoplasma is one thing that uh, we know from studies mostly done overseas, where mycoplasma infections, there's some evidence that they can be transmitted in utero to, to their offspring so that mm. even newborn children could have these infections and could, you know, may show early signs, at least the ones that show very early signs of autism, uh, may have actually contracted their infection in utero. These are things that we just don't know, but they're possibilities. Mm -hmm. Haven't been proven right now, they're possibilities, but it's something that should be looked at. It should be. I wonder why not enough people are interested. I guess because the, the liability side, because if they can see the mycoplasmas are in vaccines, God, imagine the cost to the, their industry. So they well, don't that's, <laughs> that's a funny story about that. I was, Is it funny? <laughs> I, was, I got bumped up to first class once because normally I don't have first class. But I do have a lot of flyer miles, and that um, qualifies you for getting bumped up. And so I, one time I was bumped up to first class and I happened to be sitting next to somebody who was uh, flying to Washington to, I don't know, visit the FDA or something like that. And he was going through a lot of uh, uh, drug data and vaccine data. And so I noticed this. I sort of casually told him, I asked him a question, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I've got a laboratory and we do a lot of testing for different types of infections. And one of the things that we test for is mycoplasma. And I wanted to ask you, because we found that in children that this was a, a real problem in autistic children that had been vaccinated and they have uh, these mycoplasma infections, and could they have gotten this in the vaccine? And, uh, this guy became very nervous all of a sudden, immediately almost. And I wondered, that's a curious response. And I said, uh, then the, my next question was, do you ever test for mycoplasma in your vaccine? <laughs> And his face became red, and he, he he sort of blurted out, "What are you trying to do? Force us, force us out of business? Drive us out of business?" Wow. I said, "What are you talking about? I'm just talking about testing for something that could be an important pathogen." Hmm. And he said, "You know how expensive it is to test for mycoplasma in vaccines." And so I eventually we just had to drop it because we were nearing the end of the flight, and we never really continued the. And I think if the guy could have moved, he would have change seats immediately at that point. I brought up a very uh, touchy uh, mm -hmm. subject mm -hmm. and uh, never really knew the outcome of that or what transpired, but that was my general feeling that people that in the vaccine business don't want to talk about mycoplasma. It's got to be touched. They don't want to talk about a number of different possible mm -hmm. uh, contaminants uh, of their vaccines. And we know that mycoplasma is a real contaminant because there's actually a publication on this in the journal called Vaccine where they measured commercial vaccines kind of at random and they found 6% of them were contaminated with the mycoplasma. So it's a very real thing and it's something I think that, again, needs to be followed up, but nobody, to my knowledge, has ever done this. And so it's one right. of those things that you know, we'll never really know. Okay, well, um, we've got a question come through from Carmela Walker, she's a regular. She's, um, she was asking, and there's something I'm interested in as well. You said that for the younger patients, you treated them when they had the mycoplasma firmitans and they became better. How did you treat them? Well, we had to have sympathetic pediatricians for one thing. I, we didn't, we can't, we're not allowed to treat children. 
in fact, we're a nonprofit research organization. So we really, we have to get uh, uh, physicians, attending physicians, uh, patients' physicians to buy into what we're doing and to give it a try uh, in their own patients. So we're not allowed to directly treat patients yes. as a nonprofit research organization. Mm -hmm. We can run clinical trials and we can run treatment within those clinical trials. And so that's something that we've done. But we can't, uh, people all of a sudden say, oh, gee, can I contact Professor Nicholson and get treated for this? Not really, but we can provide you with the information. And if your physician is willing to work with us, we're willing to give them advice and so on if they want to try this uh, treatment and, and testing recommendations and so on. Yes. So that's about as far as we can go. So okay. within the clinical trials that we've done, and uh, I can just point to those, uh, yes, uh, patients have been treated, not a large number, but a small number of patients have been treated and uh, we've been successful. Not in every case, but uh, I would say in a majority of cases. Okay. So why are we successful in every trace, uh, space, uh, the case that we've looked at or been exposed to? Well, these diseases for the most part are very complicated. They're not just uh, uh, unifactorial. They're not just one cause, one thing that it's determining these complex diseases. There are multiple agents, multiple exposures, multiple things that seem to go on. And so that's why they're so complicated. And so they have to be approached in that way. They have to be approached by people that are very careful, very systematic, and consider a number of these different possible reasons why the, these children are sick and they're willing to one by one go through these and, and treat these. Uh, and very few pediatricians are willing to do that. Okay. If, you're, if, if your body's uh, pretty healthy, you haven't got much fungus in your body, and your mitochondria is firing away in, each, in your cells, would you be less susceptible to the mycoplasmas, in your opinion? Oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're less susceptible to viruses. You're less susceptible to bacteria. You're less yeah. susceptible to other uh, fungi. Yes. Um, and, you know, again, all these things are there in minor amounts in your body. Your mm -hmm. body is generally holding them in check in general. How do we know that? Well, people that are immunosuppressed for whatever reason, mm -hmm. let's say they get exposed to radiation or some chemical that immunosuppresses them, all of a sudden they become, you know, often fairly quickly sick. Yes. And all of a sudden the, the disease processes start to go wild in their body. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not because they got a new infection. It's because they had an infection, which is generally held in check by their immune system. But when their immune system is destroyed one way or another, all of a sudden now, all of a sudden the process is really accelerated very quickly. Yes. Yes. And uh, the pathogenesis of the disease process goes fairly rapidly and they start exhibiting the signs and symptoms of a, specific uh, disease right hey can we can we do a bit of a change in the subject but it's the one i've been really looking forward to talking about because it's, it's a positive thing it's hydrogen water and the uh, benefits of hydrogen this is water. a new area for us yeah no. so why am i interested in hydrogen water uh this is very i've been interested in things that uh, cause healing yes and why i'm interested in things that cause healing because things that cause healing I have to do a number of different things to, to accelerate healing because healing involves a number of uh, different uh, aspects of, of our tissues and cells and so on. So we know that uh, healing, uh, we have to fight against uh, inflammation, for example. We have to promote uh, the rebuilding of damaged uh, cells and tissues and so on. So the, the number of things like that that are involved in healing. So things that cause accelerated healing should be of interest to uh, people that are interested in disease processes because these are things that could be very helpful. So that's the one thing that hydrogen water does. So if you, for example, uh, get a cut or get a burn or get some damage to your skin and you put hydrogen, hydrogenized water on it and do that repeatedly, you will notice that that healing process is accelerated. So the burn heals very quickly, much quicker than it would normally. The wound heals much more quickly than it would normally, and so on. So that's an interesting observation in itself about yes. hydrogenized water. Absolutely. So now, uh, taking that information and thinking of what disease 
processes do in your body? Well, they damage your body. They cause damage which can't heal properly. So we were talking before about the damage of reactive oxygen species and free radicals and the damage that it causes to our membrane, yes. to our DNA, to our protein. All that damage accumulates over time and that manifests in symptoms eventually uh, that we show outwardly. But long before the, we show those outward symptoms or even inward symptoms, uh, we have this in damage to our cells caused by these different reactive oxygen species. Right. So one of the things that hydrogen water does is it counteracts those reactive oxygen species. So those free radicals are attacked and neutralized by hydrogenized water. Now, how does it do this? Because here's one of the questions that we struggled with for a while with hydrogenized water because it was proposed early on that, well, what hydrogen does, it's an antioxidant. Hydrogen is a very simple molecule made up of two hydrogen atoms. So it gets together as a hydrogen atom dimer called H2. So H2 is pretty, as a matter of fact, I know this because when I went to, when I first started college, one of the ways I sort of uh, paid for my way through college was that I was a professional diver. I grew up off Southern California and I started diving at a very early age. I became a diving instructor, scuba instructor at a very early age, and I had a professional diver certification at an early age. So one of the things I used to do part-time was uh, I used to safety dive for the hard hat divers. I was always qualified. I mostly was served as a temporary safety diver off of oil rigs and things like that off Southern California. So it was very good pay. And so I drove a new car as a college student, which was absolutely amazing for a college student to drive a new car. It yes. was only because I did this okay. sort of specialized work. Yes. Anyway, and some of the deep diving that we had to do as safety divers required us to use mixtures of hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. And the reason for this was to prevent nitrogen narcosis because under pressure, nitrogen can enter your synovium and joints and eventually can cause what's called uh, diver's disease or the bends. And that's a disease where nitrogen, as you come up, uh, bubbles are released from the nitrogen that's dissolved inside your tissues and can damage your joints and actually cause paralysis. So to get around that, we breathing it deep underwater mixtures which don't contain nitrogen. Well, air is 80% nitrogen. So if you compress that and go down and breathe nitrogen at, at depths more than a few hundred feet, you're very susceptible to getting nitrogen narcosis. So with the nitrogen removed, and a helium oxygen hydrogen mixture, you don't have that problem. So you can go down and stay much longer periods of time uh, at deep diving levels, which is sometimes what we're required to do. So we were breathing these mixtures of uh, helium, oxygen, and hydrogen. So that was my first introduction to hydrogen. So we thought it was very inert. And for many years, people thought, well, helium is inert. Hydrogen must be inert. These deep divers never had a problem with it. But then we found uh, that, gee, there are these things that hydrogen can do in tissues. If people are given hydrogen as a gas, for example, there are a number of amazing things that can happen. If, for example, you have a major infarct, if you had a heart attack, for example, and you're given hydrogen gas, you can reduce the inflammation that's caused associated with that damage. You can uh, prevent some of the damage that occurs with a stroke or a heart attack some of the ischemic damage to tissue that occurs. So yeah. that's very in it's interesting in itself. And so there must be something to this hydrogen. It must be doing something. Mm. So for years, people thought, well, it must be an antioxidant because we know one of the things that happens during tissue ischemia and tissue damage is that these reactive oxygen species that I've been talking about go up to a very high level and it damages the tissues. And so if we can neutralize that and bring that back down to a lower level, we can tend to prevent that from happening. So hydrogen must be neutralizing these free radical oxidants. And it uh, turns out they don't. 
they don't neutralize it at all. So that wasn't the reason for it. Uh, Turns out, to make a long story short, what hydrogen does is hydrogen actually goes and affects our genes. So it affects gene expression, and it upregulates the natural antioxidants that are produced by our cells. These antioxidants are present all along because they're there to help neutralize these free radicals that are being produced all the time. But it turns out under types of damage and disease and injury, the level of uh, free radicals goes up much higher than the level of these normal antioxidants. So uh, the, now the free radicals can cause damage. Level of the uh, natural antioxidants that we could neutralize those, we actually neutralize those uh, free radical oxidants and then either prevent the damage from occurring or in some cases even reverse it. So that's what we now know happens. So one of the ways in which you can do that is to actually breathe gas hydrogen. Well, that's impractical for most people. You can't go around carrying a bottle of hydrogen and uh, you would want to do that anyway. So we now uh, know, and it's been known for years, that you can bubble hydrogen into water and there's a certain amount of it which will dissolve into the water. It's called hydrogenized water. And so there are a few ppm, a few parts per million of hydrogen. Uh, you can actually put it in water and you can, it can be stable in water if you put a seal on that bottle for a long period of time. So uh, hydrogenized water is now being sold or being made with hydrogen generators or so, and you can drink it and uh, bring hydrogen naturally into your system that way to kind of neutralize these excess oxidants that are produced uh, uh, as a normal consequence of aging, for example, or as disease processes. So I became interested in using uh, as an adjunct to uh, therapy against infections, hydrogenized water, and to help heal the damage uh, that to chronic infections do inside people. So hydrogenized water is one of the healing things that we now uh, suggest that people use to actually increase the rate of healing in their bodies if they've been damaged by infections or other things that can damage people as well. It's amazing. The stomach, of course, is quite a hostile environment. How much of the hydrogen will make its way from the water to our bloodstream and tissue? Well, this is the amazing thing. Hydrogen, uh, is, since they're so small, molecules are so small that they'll just penetrate very quickly through membranes. And this is something that uh, we didn't realize at first, but uh, you can take uh, hydrogen and drink hydrogenized water and that hydrogen will get in almost immediately, get in your system. And not only will it get in your system and be in your blood, but it'll get in your tissues very quickly. And even into your brain, it'll pass through the blood brain barrier. It's one of the few things that will penetrate the blood brain barrier mm. is hydrogen. So uh, this is something that we know is very effective at getting in. And the reason for that is hydrogen is the smallest atom. And a hydrogen molecule is just two of those small atoms. And so that's a very small, very tiny molecule. And that very tiny molecule can penetrate just about anything. So anyway, um, if you take hydrogen, the hydrogenized water is, is, we think, the easiest and safest way to take hydrogen because you can only dissolve so much of it into into water. And so it's kind of rate limit. And so you can drink that hydrogenized water. It's very safe. You can drink as much as you want. It's very safe. It's no safety issues at all because there's only so much of it that can be dissolved in the water. And as I said, it gets in very quickly. So uh, it turns out to be a very good uh, uh, adjuvant to treatments of various sorts. It's also a good anti-aging supplement. So for people that are interested in anti-aging, uh, hydrogen turns out to be very good because as you age, your level of these uh, free radical oxidants actually goes up slowly with time as you age. And so this contributes to the aging process and this can damage your DNA, for example, damage your cell membranes and your intracellular membranes. So if you can neutralize that uh, for those free radicals, that's good, that's a good thing. So uh, hydrogenized water is a, a good anti-aging uh, supplement, and it's very safe. Yes. Now there's... And I'm interested in things that are safe. <laughs> well, 
I did do a bit of research and I found that some tablets that you can put in water to introduce hydrogen into the water, some of them can contain traces of aluminium. Well, that's because they're using metal hydrides, for example, to produce the hydrogen. I don't recommend that because you can buy, for example, and go on the internet and you can buy metal metallic strips that will produce hydrogen. And basically they're metal hydrides. And those metal hydrides, sure, they'll produce hydrogen, but they'll also produce heavy metals. Uh, and if not heavy metals, metals of some sort. So aluminum hydride will produce aluminum ions and yeah. hydrogen yeah. if you put those strips into, into water. Yeah. So you'll be taking in a lot of aluminum. Yes. So I don't recommend that. So I recommend there, there are um, electronic uh, hydrogen generators. That, that's yeah. good. Or you can just buy hydrogenized water. So I'm a consultant, for example, to a Japanese company that produces hydrogenized water. and It's incredibly safe, incredibly pure, has none of those contaminants. So there's no, no heavy metal, no metals of any sort, mm -hmm. just hydrogen and water, pure water. Yes. So that's really a safe thing to take. And sure. Are the magnesium tablets safe? Because that's what they normally use for the hydrogen tablets. Isn't well, the, the, they can be if they're pure. Yes. Uh, here's the problem. Uh, you've got to make sure that uh, the source of the magnesium hydride, which is what they're using to generate the hydrogen, is pure and it's pure magnesium and doesn't have any other heavy metal contaminants. Now, uh, it goes without saying that there's a lot of junk out there sold on the internet that uh, make a lot of claims and yet they uh, use a lot of junk in the manufacturing process. Yes. And it's hard to make these pure magnesium hydride uh, tablets. Yes. And so you got to be very careful about yes. where you get them and, mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, they've been tested and you can see the, uh, the testing is freely available on the websites of these organizations and so on. And so you know what you're getting. Okay. So your advice is to get a either get a machine that makes it, so there's no chance of having heavy metals um, in the water. That's right, because you take pure water and it, the, it just right. use an electrode to make, generate the hydrogen. Yes. On the other hand, you can actually buy the uh, the water. Yes. Uh, yes. For example, Azumia Water is one. Uh, I'm a consultant to them, for example, and and uh, Azumia Water is pure water from a certain spring in the mountains in central Japan. And it's very, very great tasting water, spring water. And they infuse pure hydrogen into that. And they've developed a pouch that will contain that hydrogen so it won't leak out in the water. So they sell these pouches to people and you just drink the water out of the pouch and uh, you're getting pure spring water. It's great tasting and, mm. and hydrogen. Sounds very good. So really, that's another example. Sounds very really good. Now, I want to ask the $100 question. I'm going to go for the mother vein here. I'm going to talk about hydrogen, water, and mycoplasma. Now, for people that have got infections of mycoplasma and viral bacterial, now, um, in your opinion, would hydrogen water help to uh, both reduce the effects of the infections? and possibly reduce the magnitude of the infections? Okay, the first part of the question is yes. Um, really? Because I mentioned that uh, these infections cause an increase in the free radical oxidants inside cells. And so what can hydrogen water do? Hydrogen water can bring that back down again. So there's good evidence for that. Yes. The other part of your question, uh, I don't know that there's any evidence for it. In terms of the symptoms, uh, in general, people that are taking hydrogenized water are doing a number of other supplements along with that. If you look at our instructions, which are on our website, for people that have these types of infections, it goes into a lot of different things. I mean, it goes into anti-inflammation. It goes into uh, different supplements that uh, you can take to improve your immune system. Different supplements. Yeah, it goes on and on and on about different things that people can do to improve their general health. Now, um, we've added hydrogenized water 
to that list of things that people can do. But we've never really separately taken hydrogenized water and done a separate test with only hydrogenized water and asked, do, does hydrogenized water alone, without anything else, lower the symptoms of patients uh, that have these infections that that hasn't been done? That would be interesting. Then we could answer that $100 question. <laughs> yeah. But the people that uh, generally uh, follow those instructions and try everything, uh, generally they lower their symptoms and that's what they want. Yes. So they're, yes. they're not so much interested in, in what we're interested in as the evidence. They yes. just want to know what works. Yes. Give me oh, something absolutely. that works. And most so we give them a whole set of different things they can try. Now, I've got to tell you that we have a lot of recommendations on our website. Not all of these are going to work for every patient. Okay. Because the whole problem with the dealing with patients is that each one is an individual. Each one has a different uh, pathogenesis process of their disease. Each one of them have a number of other accessory problems that are associated with the disease process. They also have comorbidities. So generally, we deal with patients that have a lot of comorbidities. So we're dealing with people that have multiple disease processes that are going on in parallel. That makes it very difficult to tell them what they should be doing to improve their health. So we give them a lot of options and we just tell them, look, use what works. Try a few different things. If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, try something else. That's about the best that we can do because we have no uh, systematic way to test these people and tell them up front, you should be doing a, B, D, F, G, and forget the rest of it because it won't help you. We can't tell right. people that. Right, right. That's right. unfortunate, but we just can't do that. Mm. Well, this interview has been a bit scary at places, talking about the mycoplasma, talking about how a vaccine introduced may have introduced mycoplasma. and In some cases. Because remember, and mycoplasma, well, many of these mycoplasma species, they can be airborne, they can be fluid borne. Yeah. So, young people, for example, that come down with uh, vaccine associated uh, disorders, uh, they could pick this up from other children, their environment, or whatever. One of the things that we're worried about in young people that receive multiple vaccines is that they have to receive so many of these vaccines, in many cases all at once, mm -hmm. is that this is very immunosuppressive. Yes. This will suppress these young immune systems and make them much more susceptible yes. to picking up uh, environmental sources of infections and, yes. and environmental sources of other things as well that could contribute to, to their uh, pathologies. Yes. So that's something we have to be very concerned about. now. With time, what's happened is that we've seen an increase in the recommendations to pediatricians. It, in the 50s, what were the recommendations? More, no more than a half a dozen vaccines were recommended to be given to children. Yes. Now, it started to change in the 60s, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, all of a sudden, more, more, mm. and more vaccines were required in many cases yes. to begin children before their school age, mm -hmm. and sometimes as young as a few months old. Yeah. And the reason that all these things have to be given is that there's so many of these now, in some cases, 28, 30 or more vaccines are required before a child in some states in the United States can attend school That's at absolutely. five or six years old. Well, this is ridiculous. Oh, it's, uh, it's my feeling that uh, we don't need all these. No. And it's a big money-making machine, essentially. Okay. But uh, some of these vaccines given together in inappropriate protocols or inappropriate strategies mm -hmm. may actually be making the whole problem worse. Yes. So yes. I'm not blaming any one vaccine, which is something that is very popular. <laughs> For example, you, people come up and say, you cannot blame the MMR vaccine for causing autism. Well, that may be true, 
But if we add on top of that MMR, all these other different vaccines, and we give them all the very truncated schedules where people are getting vaccines over and over and over again every few weeks or every few months. Sure. Yeah, now maybe you're causing immunosuppression. Yes. And if there's a minor contaminant in one of those vaccines that by itself may not cause a disease process, now with the immunosuppression, all of a sudden it can take hold. Yeah. So here's the question I've always had to all these vaccine manufacturers. If there's the presence of a minor contaminant or the presence of an environment where people could be receiving certain infections, mm. if you give all these vaccines in a truncated schedule and immunosuppress these young immune systems, make them more susceptible to a disease process, could this in fact, be involved in causing autism spectrum disorders. And I say that and all hell breaks loose. Oh, you'd think that uh, I caused uh, an atomic bomb to go off or something because of wow. the reaction mm -hmm. uh, to professional people against this type of heresy. Yeah. But I think it's a real problem. I think it's a real problem too. I think it is a question that needs to be answered. How often in nature, would a person come down with measles, mumps, and rubella at the same time? So who in their right mind decided to give someone the proteins of all three at once? Where's your immune system going to start? I mean, it's like... Well, <laughs> it's again, I'm not going to go into the details on it, but the, am I against vaccines? Well, I'm actually not against vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we have a, a whole department uh, at our a nonprofit that's developing new vaccines, but mm -hmm. they're developing molecular vaccines that can be given without the chance of contaminants. Right. So these are based on giving molecules to people that will immunize them. Yes. Not these garbage pit sure. vaccines that we're giving mm -hmm. people now. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, what's the future is coming. Molecular vaccines are the future. And mm -hmm. when we get the molecular vaccines going, then I think we'll be able to use a more truncated schedule and give multiple vaccines, and they won't have the danger associated with it that we have now. So um, I'm not anti-vaccine. I just want to make that clear. But I'm anti-stupid vaccine. <laughs> I'm anti-stupid anything, but I, I agree yeah. with you. you know, it's, just, it's just crazy how we're doing things in a very primitive way. And if there's a more succinct and targeted way, method of um, priming your body, so it can attack pathogens as they enter. It's got to be. It's got to be the better way of doing it. Gosh. Well, God, well again, well, you, all these things are going to have to be tested, and it takes a long time to test them properly. And unfortunately, we're this thing. This whole thing is snowballing with the vaccines. It's going so fast now that they can't stop it. And uh, we need to step back a minute here. Let's step back a moment and look at this in a much more rational way and decide what we're doing. And I think we're, uh, it's too late for that almost. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. Someone's going to start asking this awkward, awkward question. Yeah. We need more, we need more Garth around, don't we? Hey, thank you so much for your time, Garth. It's been brilliant to have you on. Second time, everybody. And it's been a fantastic one. And talking about the hydrogen, wasn't that interesting? Um, yeah. It's a whole new area. It's a, uh, I guarantee you that as an anti-aging supplement, this thing is going to be big. Well, the, yeah, yeah. I would have, well, that's right. No one likes to get old. But, um, yeah, that's another, it's another, another topic all together. Well, Thank everybody you wants to remain, uh, you know, as young and healthy yeah. as possible. But, yeah. you know, yeah. part of the aging process is that these free radicals uh, and uh, other oxidants start to accumulate and damage our body and uh, we could see the effects of aging and so on. So uh, if this is something that will help that slow that process, yes. a lot of people would be interested in it, I think. Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Garth, thank you for your time. I know it's late in the afternoon now for you, so um, I look forward to speaking to you on the, on the third episode of... Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah, a lot to talk about still. And you'll have discovered something else, I guess. <laughs> but this, um, this hydrogen water is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to do my research as well. So, yeah, that's a new area for us. But on our website, there 
are some publications that people can download to show, yes. uh, for example, in diabetes and pre-diabetic yes. people that uh, this could be very useful, for example. Yes. Um, they may not even progress to full diabetes if they start to taking hydrogenized water, which helps at a number of different levels. So I won't even go into that, but they can go and read a, an article about that on our website. We will put a link to your website at the bottom of the published video, Gar. So um, that'll, thank you. That'll, um, that's a little thank you to you. And thank you, everyone, for watching this uh, episode 91 of SABA. Take care, everybody, and I'll catch you next week. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>